Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage your moderator, Mina al oraibi and the distinguished panelists for the seminar on financial inclusion as a pathway to resilient and shared growth. السيدات والسادة الحضور نرجو منكم أن ترحبوا بضيوف الندوة. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. Good, morning, good afternoon. And thank you for being here with us in this session on financial inclusion as a pathway to resilient and shared growth. I'm honored to be moderating this session with an incredible cast of speakers and knowledge here. Inequality comes in many forms, and financial inclusion is key to tackling it. It has been a key theme this week, but even further back in trying to find ways to have more people do better and to ensure better growth globally. Financial inclusion also leads to greater financial literacy. Broader financial access has transformative power and development globally. The global economy is not at the growth that is desired. We've heard that here, but we've also seen where the opportunities lie. Targeted measures for financial inclusion are needed. And as this week comes to a close, this is an important moment to spotlight this particular issue. Unlocking financial inclusion can create economic opportunities, build resilience, and boost growth. A win-win solution for all those involved. However, trust is key, and part of building that trust is ensuring the right regulation digitization, and inclusion of all elements, including, most importantly, the financial partners in the private sector and the public sector. Today, we'll be discussing the role of policymakers, ensuring smart policies and targeted measures, in addition to, of course, the right regulation. 24% of adults globally are not included in the financial systems. Mainly women are outside of the financial system. 50% of adults in the MENA and Africa regions do not have bank access. So how do we work to tackle these issues? Before I introduce my illustrious panel, I'm delighted to welcome Managing Director of the IMF, Kristalina Gorgieva, to set the context for this conversation. Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon. I am so glad that so many of you are joining what is going to be really a fantastic discussion, excellent panel. Uh, we are now coming uh, to the end of our annual meetings. Uh, I want to thank the Moroccan authorities for what has <coughs> been a true celebration of solidarity and multilateralism. You made it possible, thank you. Uh, and I would like to uh, especially recognize uh, Governor Juari, uh, who has championed the topic we are going to discuss uh, today, increasing financial inclusion. Uh, just think, 1.4 billion adults outside of the formal financial system. It is in everybody's interest to tackle this uh, issue. Why? Because financial inclusion unleashes entrepreneurship, consumer demand that otherwise would not be there, lifts up the functioning of the economy. Bringing people into the uh, financial system means more investments, higher productivity, particularly for women, often they are the best entrepreneurs. I'll, I'll tell you in parentheses, here in Africa, it is proven women are better entrepreneurs than men. But they have six times less access to financing. Financial inclusion can 
bring more vital capital in their hands. Um, we know that financial inclusion is a very, very diverse theme. Um, it helps us accumulate savings, access credit, acquire assets. And of course, the end result is less poverty, uh, higher standards of living. Uh, financial inclusion is also very important in a world of more frequent and devastating shocks. It boosts resilience because it helps families to prepare for what may come to them, uh, illness, unemployment. It helps governments, when a shock hits, to very quickly bring help to people that are affected. And digitalization is the most important way in which we can rapidly scale up financial inclusion. Uh, we saw that during uh, COVID. In fact, um, before COVID, we used to say the future is digital. And with COVID, the future has arrived. Uh, we now see that um, many, many more of these digitally uh, empowered schemes are in place. I want to um, refer to one, Togo Digital Cash Transfer, Novisi. It was accelerated and put in place during COVID, but now everywhere I look, it is digital that moves help to people, moves uh, investment, and uh, on that basis moves the uh, ability of the economy to accelerate. Uh, we know that digital brings the costs of transacting down. Uh, and the question for us and for this panel is uh, how can we move faster? Clearly it works. Uh, well, first, uh, we need governments to be uh, determined. Uh, comprehensive national strategies like Morocco's national strategy for financial inclusion, it has six pillars encompassing everything from expanding mobile payments to promoting financial literacy. Almost half of Moroccans today, as a result, have access to a bank account. <clears throat> it was 30% just five years ago. Um, second, prioritize financial integrity and stability. Uh, if we don't have it, then uh, we are not going to move very far, very fast. Uh, we need uh, the um, uh, recognition that, uh, that financial inclusion might be correlated to increased financial stability risks unless we are careful, unless we have the appropriate regularity, regulatory oversight and supervisory frameworks. Uh, third, promote digital and financial innovations. Uh, and uh, I know that we would hear from the panel a lot about it, so I'm not going to dwell on this point. Uh, and fourth, and this is something that we at the IMF embrace wholeheartedly, get better data on financial inclusion. Better data means better policies. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, no, a number of collaborative initiatives, including the IMF's financial access survey. It tracks access to and use of financial services. Uh, and we, you would hear more about it uh, in, um, uh, through the, throughout the day. Uh, I want to finish uh, by saying that uh, uh, when I look at the um, uh, world of today vis-a-vis -vis the world I grew up uh, in, the most important two changes I see, one, speed. Everything moves much more rapidly. Can we make speed a source of strength? Uh, and two, interconnectivity. I grew up on the other side of the Iron C Curtain. I had no idea what the rest of the world looks like. Now we are all like uh, fish in a fishbowl. We see everybody everywhere. And that we want to turn into strength. We learn from each other. We do better, faster. Uh, all the best to the panel, and thank you again for allowing, it to, allowing me to join you today. Thank you. I'm going to go thank behind you. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Oh, see you. Thank you. Thank you um, for those remarks that really help set into context why we're gathered here today. I'd like to introduce our panel and then we will get straight into our conversation. So immediately to my left is Mr. Bo Lee, Deputy Managing Director at the IMF and His Excellency Abdel Latif Jawahiri, Governor of the Bank Al Maghrib, uh, His Excellency Dr. Abdurrahman Al Hamedi, Director General Chairman of the Board at the Arab Monetary Fund, Dr. Alfred Hennig, Executive Director at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, and Charles Lee, Founder and Chairman of MicroConnect. And all of them have much longer bios, but for, the, for brevity, I will not go into them. Um, but really, I'd like to start our conversation with you, uh, Dr. Abdel Latif Jawahiri. And please, before we start, if you have your headsets and like me, do not speak French, make sure that you have a headset accessible so that you can um, understand uh, the answer as uh, Dr. Jawahiri will be speaking to us in French. Do you have one? Okay, can we get one more headset, please? It's coming to you, ah, perfect. Thank you. Wonderful, okay, so now that we've got our logistics in order, I can ask my first question, which is, give us an idea of what policies uh, can be adopted in order to ensure that broadening financial access leads to a win-win solution. Morocco has its financial inclusion strategy, and that, is working on making sure that financial inclusion can support macroeconomic objectives. Merci. Thank you very much. First of all, let me try and set the stage of our conversation today because uh, it's uh, something all uh, countries in the MENA region have in common. We have uh, a larger part of the economy that is in the uh, informal sector. And uh, as a consequence, cash transactions, uh, cash in circulation is uh, very high. And uh, we are probably among uh, the five uh, countries where cash transactions are uh, most uh, widespread. And uh, thirdly, we have uh, a Moroccan uh, community um, abroad that sends uh, remittances uh, to help uh, um, those who have stayed in Morocco. So we have realized when we and and uh, by the way the uh, managing uh, uh, director uh, mentioned it um, we have uh, done a survey and we realize that women uh, rural communities and uh, young people are the most uh, disadvantaged and also MISMEs, micro and uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. They are usually excluded from financial services. And uh, based on, on that um, survey, we uh, launched our first financial inclusion initiative. And we tried to focus on those disadvantaged and excluded uh, groups. Since they did not have access to financial services, we tried to introduce new players into the market. And uh, secondly, we tried to design um, more appropriate instruments. For example, we decided to be able uh, to, to, to allow uh, an account opening without uh, prior uh, balance. And then for transfers, we introduced uh, instant transfers. I will go back to that because of the uh, technology involved. The managing director um, did say that it was linked to technology. So we introduced instant transfers 24 seven. And this had an effect on the price on the fees of those transfers. And we made a number of operations free of charge, the most common operations. So new actors 
new products and obviously we relied on new technologies. The MD mentioned uh, mobile banking and that was crucial. But mobile banking led to a number of challenges uh, because um, small shops um, were afraid to uh, move into the formal sector, taxes, etc. And that's why we focused on financial literacy. And the central bank took the lead. In uh, 2013, uh, we created the Moroccan Academy of Financial Literacy and we started working with the ILO, with the uh, Ministry of Education, to um, develop educational toolkits for all those groups, for all those target groups. And we even produced some um, um, educational material in our dialect uh, to reach uh, those uh, most exclusive, excluded groups. And that is how we uh, moved on, as the managing director uh, rightly said, and we achieved a number of uh, outcomes. But uh, it's uh, far from over and it's still work in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I appreciate the applause, but for brevity, we're gonna ask you to applause at the very end for all our panelists. <laughs> but they were, they were worthy remarks of applause. Um, Dr. Hanning, I want to come to you because actually building on what the governor just laid out, a very comprehensive, multi-pronged approach and thinking of those who are the most excluded, but also thinking of new tools that we have with technology. I'd like to take a step back, of course, as Executive Director of the Alliance of Financial Inclusion, 88 countries, so you have a, a global view here. So we go from a very specific example to something wider to look at that link between financial inclusion and growth. And if you can give us an idea of some of the best practices you've seen sure, of this. Sure. Well, thank you very much uh, to the fund for inviting us. Thank you, Morocco, to making this happen. Actually, I, you know, when I was thinking on how I should open this, I was actually uh, thinking of what was the most impressive sentence that I heard this year. And to follow up on Governor Jouari, it was actually when he said in an official meeting, which I think was not uh, under Chatham House rules, so I can actually repeat it here, he said, for us, financial inclusion is important to maintain social peace. Mm. I found this a very powerful statement. And in fact, um, it is a very important one during these times of uncertainty and poly crisis that we have seen during the last year. And even yesterday, we heard in the debate on the global economy that actually nowadays, these days, it's very, very difficult for policymakers to make the right right choices, especially since they are competing macro objectives. But we believe that there's a real risk at the moment that financial inclusion could be crowded out from the policy agenda because of so many priorities. And we feel that financial inclusion is more important than ever, following up on what the governor said, um, as a pathway to a resilient, and sh uh, a, a resilient world and shared growth um, so this is very timely that we are discussing. And um, I would also like to say that what we are discussing today is very much aligned uh, with what many of the countries in the global south would put forward regarding financial inclusion because we are just coming back from our global event in Manila where many of these uh, things were also discussed. Now, to answer your question, I would like to focus simply on two dimensions. Mm -hmm. One is really financial inclusion and economic growth. And I think many of you have seen the numerous studies that are out there that support that the notion that financial inclusion spurs inclusive economic growth. This is mainstream today. I don't think we have to question this, but how does it work? First is basically that in most of the countries we work with, the uh, micro small enterprises is the most important sector, more than 90% in most of the countries. So in other words, policy and regulations that enhance access to high quality financial service, and I'm not saying just access, I'm saying high quality, long-term, sustainable financial services. That, especially through digitization, can actually drive economic growth 
very dramatically. And second, in many countries, and I think it was briefly touched upon by the managing director, we still have a stubbornly high gender gap. It has come down from 9 to 6 percent, but it's still too high. And the point is that there's a huge unlocked economic potential out there, and it would be very wrong not to see the real risk to have these women included because there is huge potential growth behind this. So it's a sin not investing in women. Now, how do countries address these opportunities? Among the countries that we oversee, we can say there are 57 countries that have actually come forward with national financial inclusion strategies, uh, with Nigeria being the first in 2012. And there's a clear trend in these strategies on a greater focus on targeted groups at risk that are potentially being left behind. And this is done through gender inclusive finance, looking after youth, the elderly, rural populations, MSMEs, and so forth. So all this is actually embodied in these strategies. And these examples really show that financial inclusion is super important in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. So this no one left behind is embedded in financial inclusion. And in fact, we also see that there's relation to climate change, which is again important for economic growth. So many members are actually working on inclusive green finance in order to, through smart financial inclusion, mitigate impact of the environmental issues we are aware of. And I would like to end the short statement just by saying it is not only growth, it's also stability. The MD hinted at it. There is a clear connection, a complementarity between monetary and financial stability and financial inclusion. <coughs> and it works both ways. Financial stability depends on inclusion, and inclusion depends on stability. We should not lose sight of this. And I would like to end the first round with this statement. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, really important points, especially this idea of smart financial inclusion. We often talk about financial inclusion, but we need to make sure it's smart financial inclusion. And importantly, also this idea that not to leave particular groups hindered. Um, Mr. Lee, I want to turn to you. Of course, your career from uh, you know international investment banks to CEO of the Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing. You know, as we heard from Dr. Hennig. We know the, the, the argument is there for the importance of financial inclusion. But one, how to prioritize it, not lose sight of it. And two, uh, for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, how do we particularly make sure that they are being catered to? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the consensus is so overwhelming that financial inclusion is something we want. But the stubborn question is why current financial system are not able to do that. I think it's really boils down to the two big functions that Wall Street deliver for all the investors. And uh, one is information integrity and truthfulness. Two is transaction delivery security. And uh, the first one, we require all the accountants and the lawyers and everybody to determine that information integrity. And then the second, we need all the banks and broker dealers and, uh, and the custody banks to deliver security for transactions in order for the investor to make that investment. Both of them require massive resources, which means that only companies of big size are able to afford it. So we force little guys to grow. We are saying capital is not going to come to you unless you grow up into a bigger boy, and then we will deal with you. That finally has changed, because today we started in China. Uh, China is largely a cashless society. In a cashless society, information integrity, if you look at revenue only, it's all there every day. It's in the consolidated payment pipeline of every single shop. You don't need accountants and lawyers to tell you how much money is going through the pipe, number one. Number two, you are able to put a digital collection system into that pipe so that you can get money directly from the pipe every day. Now, with that, transaction delivery can also be you know, uh, secured without having massive amount of uh, big institutional help. With this two big infrastructure completely becoming possible, now finally the solution is around the corner. Started in China and is gonna follow up by everybody else. That is, let's break down Wall Street into small little pieces. Instead of big equity, big debt, 
of big corporations. Let's do shop level businesses, break it down into revenue based discovery. So basically all investment is on revenue based. It's based on daily, that every day we're able to collect money back and based on digital collection. So this called a daily revenue contract, DRC, that allows us to invest it, pinpoint into small shops with minimum cost of deployment, with minimum cost of information discovery, but meanwhile, you are able to collect money every day, providing secured investment returns for the investors, because investors have to make money in order for this thing to sustain. This cannot be a charity. It has to be on the one, small businesses are great businesses, but their businesses independently, individually are not bankable today. But if we're able to do daily revenue contracts and be able to collect money coming back daily, then you can break the traditional either debt or I'm your creditor, no matter what, you have to pay me. Or I'm your equity holder, no matter what, I'm gonna be forever with you. The little guys want something in, in mixed. If I fail, better I don't have to pay because otherwise my whole family is in debt forever. But if I work out successfully, better I not pay you too much. That sounds too good to be true. But in a daily revenue context, investors can make a lot of money out of that too because number one, you share the risk, you take some higher returns. Number two, you're taking money every day directly from front line. So when the little guy lives, you're the front, front line taking, some money, taking the money. But most importantly, because of his daily, it's the daily compounded reinvestment. Warren Buffett talked about compounded reinvestment for 60 years that he has lived a very long life. We are able to do 365 compounded reinvestment every year. So that delivered the magic. So for every dollar you invest, you create a $1.7 EUM. And that allowed the little guys to make very, very good living without worry about downside, without worry about forever being somebody's permanent. So it's permanent capital without permanent dilution. And then investors are able to make a juiced up return on compounded daily returns. That is the key, and that's going to be a global solution. I'm convinced that it's going to start China, and it's going to be everywhere else. But that solution really relies on, as you said, data hygiene, transparency, the right regulations, and stability. And here I want to turn to uh, Deputy Managing Director Lee to pick up from that point about the risk. You need to regulate, but not regulate too much. You need to allow that sort of access, but also make sure there's stability and continued financial stability. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up on what uh, uh, Charles Lee and also Dr. Hanek uh, said about the relationship between uh, financial inclusion and financial stability. Um, let me quickly make three points. The first point is that um, financial inclusion actually supports uh, financial stability because through financial inclusion, we could have more diversification. We could have more risk sharing, and that's good for stability. And also, if we have financial inclusion, we're going to convert a lot of informal transactions into the formal system, and that will give us data that will give us information, that will enable better risk management, that will enable better regulation. So financial inclusion, so my first point is financial inclusion is good for financial stability. Mm -hmm. My second point <clears throat> is that without proper regulation, financial inclusion could also create risks that we do not want to see, right? For example, if we have rapid credit growth because of financial inclusion, if we do not regulate or supervise properly, rapid credit growth could create financial stability risk. And we see that in some countries in Africa. In 2009 and 2010, uh, Nigeria has very rapid credit growth, credit growth because of fintech. And it created a financial stability risk. There were bank failures and there were bailouts. Mm -hmm. Another example would be if you have rapid digitalization without proper regulation, you may have cyber attacks. You may, have, you may sacrifice data privacy, and you may sacrifice financial integrity, right? Let me give you another example. In this country, in Morocco, in 2020 alone, there were 71 million 
cyber attacks in that one year alone. So if you do not have proper regulation, proper security, financial inclusion could create risks that we do not want to see. That's my second point. My final point is that the good news is that if we do have proper regulation, if we do have proper supervision, we could manage the risk properly so that we can support financial innovation. We can support digital innovation to increase uh, financial inclusion. So for that to happen, to have the proper ecosystem, we need information architecture, right? We need data. We need information. For example, the credit information architecture based on non-traditional data, based on digital transaction data that provide more information to financial service provider for them to better manage their risk. That could reduce financial stability risk. For another example, our financial regulatory system should not only cover traditional financial institutions, but should also cover the newcomers, the new players like MicroConnect, right? Our financial supervisory system should cover both traditional players, but also non-traditional players. Let me give you another example. Our financial integrity work, we should also cover this new area of digital finance, such as anti-money laundering, such as data privacy, such as cybersecurity. All this regulation and supervision should be put into place. And, and also the governor probably mentioned the, the financial literacy education and consumer protection are also important in the age of digital finance. But all this has to be done with one principle in mind, one that is proportionality. Sure. Because we don't want to kill innovation. We don't want to use a nuclear weapon to kill a mosquito, right? So we want to be proportional to the risk, especially for basic financial services. We do not want to introduce too much regulation that will, could stifle in the innovation. So we have to properly balance between the need to support innovation, but at the same time to protect the small players, protect the consumers and, and small investors. So that proper balance is an art that legislators and regulators have to balance. I'll stop here. Thank you. On this point, I want to turn to Dr. Hamidi because at the Arab Monetary Fund, there are different avenues through which you're working on financial inclusion, but there's also this issue of regulation and making sure that the wider ecosystem is well suited. From your vantage point, what are the priority policies in order to allow for this, again, financial stability, financial inclusion, and regulatory system to be up? Thank you very much. And I would like to start by congratulating Morocco on a very successful organization of such an important meetings. And I um, also would like to say how challenging is it to speak the last among four distinguished speakers, especially after Governor Jawahiri. We work very closely with central banks in the region, mm -hmm. specifically the governors on that issue. And uh, uh, good um, policy priorities has been created within the Council of Central Bank Governors that have made, we made good progress since 2017, because in 2017, the Financial Arab Day for Financial Inclusion was approved by the Council, and I will speak about that later. But to start with, I, I will mention that maybe just um, for not repeating what has been said, I will be very brief, but one of the most important policy priorities for access and financial inclusion we have noticed and we work with the central banks in the region is digitization. And I don't want to repeat what the managing director has said and Governor Jawahiri, but I think this is very important, not only in the private sector, but also for government payments, because digitizing government payments also will facilitate financial inclusion, and that would bring vulnerable groups into the, um, uh, into the domain of, of the financial sector, because there is a good disbursement of government payments to that, to that group. The other also issue which is mentioned by the governor is the financial literacy, and I think this is very important, and with 
the direction of governors, we started at the AMF publishing small booklets that is directed to two or three uh, age categories, from eight to 12 and from 13 to 18. So we are ta targeting the youth and we have been sending those booklets to different institutions in our region, uh, to educational ministries, to different agencies, and those are very easy to read for the young generation to access. And I would like, the managing director mentioned the 1.5 billion outside the financial sector, and this is sometimes being looked at if it's a burden on the financial sector. The fact of the matter, with some of the studies we have done and the analysis of the data, there is a very good opportunity for the private sector. And when we speak about financial inclusion, I think it's very important that we identify the opportunities for the private sector so this segment of the population would be included and not to say it in a way as if they are the vulnerable groups or those who might have issues, but they, those are the groups that they could bring also business and cooperate with the private sector. If we go to certain countries in our region, the informal sector is a, a very high in terms of percentage and it would go from you know, a, a small percentage to a much higher in some of the countries. Now imagine if we can bring this informal, not only, I'm not talking here about you know, taxing the sector, it's the incentive is to bring them, start to have accessibility to the financial sector, and then other issues of taxation would come through. But I think also this is very important. Also, my, my previous um, uh, intervention spoke about the SME sector. I think this is extremely important to pay a lot of attention to the SME sector, and that would reduce the uh, amount of cash outside the banking sector, as stated by the, the governor, the, uh, also promoting gender economic equality. I think this is extremely important. The youth, you know, the percentage of young in our, the youth in our region is probably the highest among all regions in the world. And those, they have no issue in, 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 in the use of technology. And therefore, we can facilitate the inclusion of the youth, specifically women, and this is part of the research we do. We think that that would help to the inclusion of women, especially financing their microfinance initiatives. That will help to create jobs. And um, the, the uh, col collecting data and analyzing those data also would facilitate and define the gaps. Uh, last but not least, I think sharing experiences among each region. Then that's what we do at the level of, um, we have a financial inclusion task force coming from central banks. They meet and therefore they exchange among themselves their uh, experiences and that has been making a very big impact. On the Arab Day for Financial Inclusion, which was actually approved by the governors in 2017, each year, that day, some of the central banks in the region made it um, uh, a week of financial inclusion. Others made it a month of financial inclusion. And they have been opening, they have been instructing banks to open their doors for opening accounts at no cost. They go to universities, they go to high schools, and I think there is a lot of, there is an ownership right. with each member country to facilitate the financial inclusion and central banks, and here I thank the central banks and governors in the region for facilitating that effort. And they keep reminding the financial sector, different players in the financial sector, not only banks, insurance companies, mm -hmm. finan uh, financing companies, also to facilitate the financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> um, Again, all worthy of applause, so thank you. Um, Dr. Hanek, I want to come to you about, you know, we talk about the region and it's difficult because it's, we're actually trying to tackle Middle East, North Africa, and Africa, hugely uh, different yeah. from country to country. And um, as Dr. Hamedi was saying, is that different central banks uh, are, are taking on this challenge in addition to wider institutions. I want to ask you, when you look at this region, yes. where do you see opportunity, but also where do we need improvement? Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Um, first, very briefly, uh, Mr. Lee from, from the IMF, I, I really appreciate your point on proportionality. 
well, I mean, the example you are using, the nuclear weapon and, and the mosquito, I'm not 100% I'm not sure how the global standard setting bodies would see that example, but I'm very happy that we can work together on this because proportionality in practice is super important in order to drive these solutions, including what, what uh, the other Mr. Lee is actually promoting there um, out of Hong Kong. Now, um, to the region, um, let me first say that, that um, of course, we are aware that uh, the, I would say, the Arab region, if you allow me to, f to narrow it down in the interest of time, is among the most uh, constrained and challenged when it comes to high quality and sustainable financial inclusion. And uh, um, Dr. Alhamidi has given a, a few uh, issues around the problem statement in the region. Now, I think one of the most important challenges we see is that, the st uh, that of course, the gender gap is higher than elsewhere. The gender gap also has come down from 17 to 12 percent, but it is still very high. And I think this is one of the challenges that the central banks, especially from the emerging and, and, um, and uh, developing economies in the region, have really recognized. But as well, MSMEs, as Mr. Hamidi said, and youth. These are, I think, the main problem issues we are dealing with. Now, when we look at our own member needs assessment, we do see from the members a preference around uh, policies such as digital financial services regulation, inclusive green finance again, MSME financing, and also again, national financial inclusion strategies. These are among the highest uh, priorities when it comes to policy solutions. But one thing, and this is what should actually make us very optimistic in the region, um, despite the fact uh, that there are these challenges, this region has also some of the most sophisticated policy responses and regulations in place that are based on national commitments. And I don't want to repeat what uh, Governor Juari said from Morocco, but uh, we actually at uh, AFI, we are in the position uh, to actually award policy solutions on an annual basis. And I wanted to share with you a few examples uh, to see actually what this is all about. For example, in 2023, just now, the Central Bank of Egypt won uh, the Global Youth Financial Inclusion Award. And this award actually um, uh, addressed these innovations around financial education curriculum for students, encouraging banks actually to develop tailored products for the youth, resulting in youth products being offered by 27 out of 35 banks, which I think is great. Simplified KYC regulations to allow the 16 to 21 year olds to open accounts with even needing an approval of a guardian. And of course, also the collection of gender disaggregated data, because we all know, and I think it was said by the managing director, data informs policy. So I think there are great uh, initiatives here. Also, the Palestine Monetary Authority last year was also the winner of the Global Financial Inclusion Award. And they have launched an app, the Masrifi app, for, for financial education of youth. So these are wonderful examples. I would like to maybe just to to close with another one, which is very interesting for all of us, and this is the Central Bank of Tunisia, was a finalist for the Youth Award in 2023. And here, the, the Central Bank has come up with a very creative project to promote financial education through media for children, five to 14 years old. It covers 25 episodes, and they have also designed an e-learning platform for youth to with uh, including actually four modules. I think these are very impressive examples, which I think should make us very optimistic. I think the region is well set, and, and I think these, these uh, policy solutions are also looked at elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee, I'd like you to pick up on that. We've heard examples of where uh, here in the region the public sector has supported financial inclusion. I'd like to know from you where we can improve, especially the private sector involvement. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, we all wanted big capital to finally help the little guys. And uh, the public market, um, you, know, the, you know, in China, for example, there are 70 million small shops. That really is the foundation of China's economy and consumer economy. And um, each year, 6 million closed, 9 million opened. So it's just continued to thrive. And, um, you know, in order for us to do this right, the capital, the reason in the past the Wall Street is able to work is because we rely on big institutions, rely on big companies. There are only 20,000 listed companies around the globe. 
and we all pay a lot of PE multiples for their, you know, for, you know, for those companies, and so value get created and destroyed because we largely trade together, and the sentiment cannot be diversified. When you come to small businesses, if we're able to break down small businesses into shop levels, into revenue, only into the next uh, maybe a thousand days, you know very clearly what's in there. So if the market is able to essentially break down the big rocks into small pieces, and then financial inclusion can actually happen with a lot of money being made by the investors and helping the little guys. But how do we deploy so fast and so, you know, into cover so many numbers? So, you know, we obviously have a number of strategies we're not going to go through right now, but the key in the future is that starting from January, we're going to, we already include, invested in over 12,000 little shops. We're going to put all of them into a financial statement every day, like the gap for all big companies listed. So every day, starting from January, hopefully we will be able to tell you every day for this shop how much money we received, our investor received, how much money until that day, accumulative they have received, and how much money yet to be received before the contract runs out. If we are able to do this accounting, sort of a new generation of accounting every day on every day, rather than quarterly or annually, and then on small shops rather than big companies, that will have a big signal. It's almost like 10,000 lights. And then small little guys will start realizing, my shop can access that kind of capital. And all they need is a few data entry points and the terms are generated by the algos, by the data. So digitalization, data, and the ability to tap into the payment system and focusing on small, simple, shop-level businesses. I think we can break this code, and it's happening, and I think it's going to happen very fast. Thank you very much. Um, Governor Zhuhei, I want to turn to you, because we've heard about the importance of stability, heard the importance of thinking of the little guy, and also data transparency. But there is a concern about risk. So how do we mitigate against the risk of instability while we're ensuring a faster financial inclusion as uh, the managing director asked us to think about. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Uh, the microphone is not working for the speaker. The microphone. Maintenant. Ah. 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 Thank you. Je, je, je disais. Ah oui, ça va mieux. Ça va mieux. Je, je disais que. I was saying that, first of all, from what I heard from uh, other panelists, very often the central bank is in charge of uh, that aspect. And for a central bank, there are a number of uh, uh, crucial aspects, and first and foremost, the central bank's reputation. And uh, by reputation, I mean uh, risk oversight and risk management. Obviously, uh, when you talk uh, about uh, digitalization, I am not as uh, advanced as our friend from uh, China or Singapore. Uh, we are not at that level on uh, digitalization. We are mere developing countries. So um, we each have our own uh, speeds and specificities. But what is crucial is uh, the uh, uh, camel uh, approach, uh, the camel gate, uh, as I uh, uh, already uh, said a few times. The camel um, is, uh, is a very uh, cautious and um, the uh, first uh, uh, leg comes first and the second follows only once it is confident uh, that uh, it's secure. So when you, uh, it's, it's a good thing uh, to be innovative, but you need to be mindful of uh, risks. 
um, we dealt with AML CFT and there is also the issue of personal data protection and other risks like uh, uh, the uh, deputy uh, uh, my managing director said it's the cyber security issue. It's true that we've suffered a number of uh, cyber attacks, but uh, uh, we never had to pay ransom. So that means that our system is resilient. Um, and I think that that's what we should um, aim for. And there is one other actor that was uh, not mentioned, and that is uh, crucial, it's microcredit associations. And those microcredit uh, associations are very often set up by women who offer each other uh, financing guarantees. And those uh, women engaged in those um, guarantee operations are much more uh, vigilant about uh, deadlines and the maturities than men. So that is why I'm saying that we uh, tried to move forward, but uh, mindful of uh, risks and innovation. And we uh, signed an agreement with the uh, National uh, Safety uh, Authority. Um, and uh, we called out the third party uh, guarantee. So we signed a memorandum of understanding, which means that there is um, trust, uh, the, and this trusted intermediary checks that uh, there is uh, nothing um, against uh, that uh, operator and uh, it makes things easier. And now with uh, innovation, we have uh, fintech uh, players and uh, we took the lead as a central bank and we have set up this fintech ecosystem that needs a number of uh, financial means and we have uh, um, disbursed funds so that we can act uh, on education, innovation uh, for those young people and uh, uh, reach uh, innovative solutions. Though that's more or less what we're trying to do and uh, obviously uh, uh, the collaboration with our friend Hanig, Al Hamidi and other entities allows us to uh, move ahead because it's only together that we can uh, uh, move forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Al Hamidi, I, can, I want to turn to you just briefly to comment on this collaboration because it is ensuring that there's learning from one another and that collaboration with the central bank governors. How do you see that, particularly when it comes to private sector enablement? Let me give you the cooperation of the private sector through the Arab Day of Financial Inclusion, because that have created the momentum in our region for financial inclusion. And here I thank different organizations that have worked with us and are still working with us on the financial inclusion initiative in this region, including AFI here in for that matter. But Arab Day of Financial Inclusion is started by uh, 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 a suggestion from the Council of Central Bank Governors approved. And the, what we have noticed the first year, it was like the central bank pushing the commercial banks to work on that day and therefore they wanted to please the central bank and they thought this is something, a duty we have to do. However, the following years was different. Mm. So we, we, what we do, a um, few months before that day, we ask central banks what your banking system going to do on that day. So they provide us with all the information. We disseminate all the information in the region. That have created the needed partnership between the central bank so it did not become like an order from central bank to commercial banks. It created the partnership between central banks, commercial banks, insurance companies, finance companies, colleges, 
ministries of education. We have noticed in some uh, uh, countries there is the first half day of that day of financial inclusion. It's all about financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. Colleges, they will invite banks to speak. This have created, this really have created that needed partnership and it made a great impact. And we have noticed through the collection of statistics a good improvement. Yes, we, we need to do a lot more, but we have noticed a good improvement in the financial inclusion, especially for youth, uh, specifically women here. And I also thank the Union of Arab Bank. They are with us here. For That has created the momentum in the region for everybody. They have all their member banks working and cooperating with the, uh, with the public sector to disseminate those information. What also we have noticed that banks started to look, this is an opportunity, this is no longer cost. The creation of a good partner, a positive partnership between the public and the private sector. And I am a believer of the wisdom of central banks, and therefore central banks has done an excellent job for recreating that partnership without keeping pushing the private, the, the commercial banks for that. We, we do at our end, as um, uh, an executor of this decision, we do little. We only announce and we do you know, a, a conference for an hour, that's it. But the whole week or the whole month, that has created the momentum in the region. And I really here would like to thank both the, the, the central bank. So if there is price next year, I think it should be <laughs> for both that partnership for the private sector and the public sector in our region. And, and that's the best type of policy that can create momentum that then can work on its uh, own. I want to turn to you, Deputy Managing Director Lee, about the funds role in this, when we talk about all of these uh, best practices, but also new technologies, new policies. How can the fund help in this particular uh, matter of financial inclusion? Thank you for that. Um, I'm happy the guardian of uh, global macroeconomic and financial stability. And uh, we have realized uh, in our work that financial inclusion could be an important factor when we con consider financial stability. Let me give you a couple of examples. Last year, IMF adopted the first gender strategy in the history of the fund. So in the gender strategy, there is a financial inclusion aspect. Because what we found is that in many countries, women have different access compared to men to financial services. Mm -hmm. For example, in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, adult women, only 35% of adult women have deposit accounts. But 60% of men 6% of adult men have deposit accounts. So the difference, the gender gap, in terms of financial access, you can see it's huge. 35% versus 60%. Let me give you another example. 40% of the countries that we studied, men enjoy a faster digital adaptation, digital adoption in terms of finance. Digital financial inclusion increased faster for men than women in 40% of the countries that we studied. So we see significant gender gap in terms of financial inclusion. That is why in our first ever gender strategy, we had a financial inclusion component. Let me give you an, another example, which is the same year last year, we adopted our first fragile fragile and conflict-affected states strategy. We call them FCS strategy, because there are many countries in this, in this world are either fragile or are affected by conflicts. For example, a civil war. So for these countries, financial inclusion are particularly challenging. So in our FCS strategy we adopted last year, we also had a financial inclusion component for example, in the, we have a financial access survey. And in the financial access survey, we cover 191 countries, including 39 
FCS countries, fragile and conflict countries. For another example, we, in our TA, in our capacity building, capacity development work, we provide technical assistance to, to FCS countries, fragile countries, conflict countries. We provide technical assistance to help build resilience in their basic financial services, such as payment, such as deposit taking. So we want, the, we, we want those services to be resilient, even in the face of conflicts. So that's our, our goal, to help them to have resilience, to, to have the financial inclusion, even in the face of conflicts. Let me give you one more example in terms of uh, financial inclusion. Our work on digital money, we have a we also have a digital money strategy, which was also adopted several years ago. So in our digital money strategy, financial inclusion is a big part of it. In particular, for central bank digital currency, CBDC, we view CBDC as an opportunity to improve financial inclusion. Why? Because potentially CBDC could inherit some desirable features of cash but it's digital, it's digital cash. So what's the desirable feature of cash? First of all, you can have cash without a bank account, right? You could hold cash without bank account. Yes. So we want to do the same for CBDC. So we want people to have CBDC to have central bank digital currency without bank account. So that's one thing we try to help our member to achieve. The second thing we want our member to achieve in our CBDC program is that CBDC could potentially be deployed without internet, offline. So they should try to introduce offline feature into the CBDC design. For example, Bank of Ghana, they have eSETI, their, their digital currency, central bank digital currency program, and they have offline capabilities. That is, they can be used even without internet. That's important. That also help financial inclusion, and of course, one key aspect of financial inclusion for CBDC is that it is legal tender. It enjoys the universal trust of every citizen, every store, every shop. So that's also one aspect of financial inclusion because if you have CBDC, everybody will accept it. So that's financial inclusion. So let me add one more point before I conclude. I think the one thing I like about what Charles Lee is doing is that Financial inclusion is not only about payment. It's not only about banks. It's also about capital market. Can we allow small people, small shops to access capital market? I think Charles Lee is precisely trying to do that, to connect capital market with small shops. Let me give you another example on capital market. Our research also shows, it doesn't have to be digital finance. Our research also shows for pension reform, if you try to build a fully funded pension system, it could actually increase financial inclusion in terms of allow more, more individuals to access capital market investment indirectly through pension funds. So that's also one, one example of financial inclusion. I stop here. Thank you very much. Only because we've run out of time, I'm sure we could build up on many of these examples. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time, but I'm going to ask you each to give me one word. That's your challenge. As we leave here and we're thinking about financial inclusion and how to make sure that we prioritize it and we implement it, give us one word to keep in mind. I'm going to tell you the word that I wrote down, which is stability. Mr. Lee, I'll start with you. Little guys. Okay. Dr. Henning. Resilience. Digitization and opportunities. Okay. Governor Jawahiri. One word. Keyword. Keyword for financial inclusion. Sports education. <laughs> I would say education. <laughs> and Deputy Managing Director Lee. Africa is a leader and can continue to be a leader with uh, IMF support. Great. Okay. Well, th this was an IMF seminar, so you have a sentence instead of a word, but I guess you're the host. Thank you all for being here. Please show our panel some love. <laughs>